Welcome back everybody. This is uh, going to be uh, the second part of the inductors and transformers theory video. And uh, we already talked about inductors and uh, how to find cross-sectional area and core materials. And today, or on this video, we're actually going to talk about transformer design. And this is going to be the practical aspect. We will have videos after this that will show and explain how to actually go about using them using test tools and how to actually design and I'll give a couple examples that way. So we're going to talk a little bit about transformer design. Now I don't have any transformers on this table, these are all inductors, but transformers and inductors are very very similar. So the equation we're going to use for calculating transformers is this equation here. Now this equation is known as the universal transformer EMF equation. Now, it should be noted that this equation is for sinusoidal um, voltages and currents being applied to the transformer. However, this equation can be used to model square wave drive as well. It's not as close of an approximation, but it will get you very close. So, this value here... Oh, actually... Actually, I should start off by explaining to you that transformers don't saturate in the same way that inductors do. And the reason for that is, is because we have a primary that's putting in or applying a net flux to the transformer, you also have a secondary that's absorbing that net flux and converting it back to a voltage and current. Now, that net flux in the core will never saturate the core, assuming you never exceed the voltage turn ratio of a transformer. Now this voltage turn ratio is denoted by these four values. Now these four values are frequency in Hertz, your number of turns. This value is important. You should always choose the lowest number of turns. So if your secondary has the lowest number of turns or your primary has the lowest number of turns, use the value with, that has the least turns. Uh, your cross-sectional area, which we talked about how to calculate in the previous video, and once again, this should be in meters squared. And B, which is your flux density, your maximum flux density, and this is in Tesla. Now, once again, we choose our value for Tesla, or for B, based on the manufacturer specifications. So back to that large ferrite toroid that we talked about in the previous video, this particular max flux density is 470 millitesla or 0.47 tesla. Now, this particular value is important because it'll tell us it'll tell you what your core can handle as far as flux density. Now, when you take all these values and you multiply them together and multiply them times the constant 4.44, which is the square root of if I'm I can't remember off the top of my head, you get a voltage RMS. Now this voltage RMS is the maximum amount of voltage you can apply to the fewest number of turns at a given frequency that will not saturate this core for this cross-sectional area and this peak flux density. So, an example. If we have a core, let me pull up my numbers on my computer here, I'd recommend creating an Excel spreadsheet. Now an Excel spreadsheet is very, very useful for this. So, a perfect example here is this, I basically have it calculating cross-sectional area, and I have it converting from centimeters over to meters for me. So this is for a square core, for a square core that has a cross-sectional area or of one times one. So the cross-sectional area would essentially be one centimeter squared, or in the case of meters, it, which it automatically converts. The frequency here is 100,000 hertz, or 100 kilohertz. The number of turns is 10 turns, and the peak flux density is 0.2 tesla. Now the important thing about um, choosing flux density is although on the manufacturer data sheet we see 0.47, it's important that we don't actually use that value in our calculations. And the reason for that is, is because we want a margin of error. If we put in 0.47 and we run right at 0.47, there's a very high chance that we'd saturate. So what we actually do is we choose a value like 0.4 or 0.3 or something slightly lower than 0.47 to give us a very large margin of error. In this particular example, we're using 0.2 Tesla. And you can see here, it gives us a voltage RMS of 8.8 
volts. Now, this is the maximum amount of voltage we can apply to 10 turns on that type of core before it saturates it. And you can see here, you can divide that number by the number of turns, and you can get voltage per turn as well. In that case, it's 0.88 volts. That's pretty much all you have to know for transformer design. The only other thing that's uh, rather important, and I explain this again with the inductors, is on your manufactured data sheet, be sure to check uh, your core losses per frequency. And they will usually denote your core losses um, as a function of flux density and frequency. This is a general rule of thumb. As you go up in frequency and you go up in flux density for a given core, your losses increase. So a way to uh, make your losses lower is either one, use a lower frequency, two, use a lower flux density, and for lower flux density that would either mean using a larger core or more turns or both. So those, those things right there can actually be used to make your core losses lower. And core losses, in case you're wondering, will show up as in the form of heat in your core. So your core will actually heat up. And once again, the other thing that influences this a lot is your core material. This particular one is for ferrite, so you can see there that the flux density is rather low. For iron, it's generally higher. So that's basically all I have for transformer design. Transformer design is, is relatively simple, believe it or not. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, some, some practical transformers. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with step up and step down transformers. Those are very simple. But there's some other transformers you can use that are also very, very simple. Here's a perfect example of a uh, common mode choke. Now basically what happens here is you've probably seen these in every computer power supply ever invented, is you essentially have a ferrite core and you have your in your basically your positive line and it's putting basically flowing in this direction and then you have your negative line flowing in this direction. Now since they are wound in the same direction but the current is flowing in opposite directions. Now keep in mind this is an AC signal so basically when this side is going positive this side's going negative. And what that essentially means is is that this one is going to be driving flux in this direction and this one's going to be fly driving flux in this direction. So essentially ideally the fluxes will cancel. Now, this is important because if you have any kind of noise on one of these lines, it's essentially going to create a neck flux in one direction, and that will cancel out the noise. It's a very cool concept. That's a particular transformer where you, and it's also a very good example to show you why the fluxes in a core cancel in a transformer, where an inductor if you just completely got rid of one of these, you'd have a net flux driving in this core. And that net flux is what would actually end up saturating your core. But with a transformer, you have the two net fluxes canceling each other. So essentially, the only thing you have to worry about is the voltage turn ratio of your transformer. So that's all I have on transformer design. I know I said that a couple times before, but whatever, I'm absent minded. I will uh, actually start talking about practical applications using test tools in our next video and I will give some examples on some transformers that we can actually design right here in the little home lab here. And uh, that's it for now. I will do the part three or practical applications of this video next time. Thanks for watching.